And then one day I got a message from him. I found it. I found the spot. It's unbelievable. So he found a piece of land for sale that had the huge ancient trees that I wanted. And he was really emotional because he found trees that he'd barely seen because they'd been logged to, to extinction in, in most areas. And he sent me a photo of him standing next to this huge tree. And it was a cedar species that he'd never seen before. And it had a great big number 11 spray painted on it because the owner of the land was planning on cutting down this tree because the wood's so valuable. And that is Jenna Bell, the founder of the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. And the story she's telling there is the story of when they first found the parcel of land in the Peruvian Amazon rainforest that they're going to buy for protection and conservation. So it was a really exciting story, and we'll get to that in a second because I want you to hear this. I'm going to spend just a little bit longer talking before we get into the intro than I normally do because I do want to make sure that the importance of this episode of the podcast is conveyed to you, the listener. If you are a fan of animals at home or have been listening or watching the videos, you know that I support the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. And if, if you've not heard that before, if this is your first episode you're listening to, I do recommend that you go to episode two of the podcast. It's just a short 15 minute episode. And it really breaks down the way that my relationship with Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. But in a nutshell, uh, I take some of the proceeds that I make off of this, uh, the podcast and YouTube and the blog, and I donate it to the charity. And this was a really important step for me to allow myself to ethically be okay with keeping the animals. And I also thought it was a really unique way to allow other keepers, other people in the hobby to also contribute to the charity just by virtue of, you know, watching and engaging in my content, just by watching the videos and seeing ads or paying for something off of Amazon through one of my links, you know that some donations are going to make their way to ARC. And some of you have even taken the extra step and bought an animals at home t-shirt where $5 is donated right to the charity. So my goal was to have hobbyists who are definitely far removed from the Amazon rainforest, allow them to actually contribute to the protection of the rainforest. And, you know, I knew that there would be plenty of hobbyists who would have an interest in doing that because that's where our animals come from. The animals that we own, the animals that we love to care for, that's their native habitat. And of course, we have tons of motivation to protect that chunk of land because that's where our animals come from. And Animals at Home was designed in my brain to allow everyday keepers to interact with content that they're going to be learning about their animals and maybe potentially purchasing things off Amazon. And just by doing that, they're actually going to be protecting wildlife. So I thought it was very important that I had Jana on the show so she could really explain to us exactly what it is we're contributing to, what it's like being in the rainforest or on the specific land that we're helping protect, what it's like what the animal a wildlife is like, what the dangers and the destruction is like. And we get into all that in interview. And it is, I think, really important for all of us to hear because we are all contributing to helping protect it. And the other thing is, I, you know, the hobby has gone down. A, oh, and I've talked about this lots, but it, it's kind of in a dark place in some sense. Like there's some really positive things in the hobby, but there is a lot of negativity in the hobby. In the hobby. You know, there's lots of very poor keeping going on and Anybody that's new into the hobby usually gets roasted as soon as they get on Facebook. There, there's lots of negativity. And to be completely honest, when I first approached ARC asking if I could publicly support them, the first answer was they would rather I didn't. And I'm not at all surprised by that because a, a charity wanted as a charity they wanted to separate themselves away from the exotic pet trade because those two things almost seem counterintuitive. And I totally understand why they would say that. Because the, the pet hobby does seem very destructive and it doesn't seem destructive. It is destructive in a lot of ways. And my goal was to find people like yourself listening who don't see the hobby that way and who want to contribute and want to have a positive effect on the animal's lives rather than just have a business that's breeding uh, and so on and so on. So, you know, I really had to almost argue my case to the to the board of, of ARC to, to say this is why I, I think it would be great if we could contribute and this is my vision and eventually they totally agreed and, and they could see my vision and that was that was the 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 breakthrough is when they saw wow there's actually a whole bunch of people that really care about animals that would be actually interested in helping protect that part of the land. And now I'm super proud to say that Animals at Home is an official sponsor on Amazon Rainforest Conservancy's page. And we've come a long way in that sense. So I really thank you guys as listeners because I know you have a lot to do with that because you are the type of people that want to help the wildlife and help the animals rather than just use them as an industry. So I won't say any more. I know that was a lot more than I normally say. Let's just get into the interview. Hi, I'm Dylan, and you're listening to the Animals at Home podcast. 
So Jenna, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it and I'm glad that we were finally able to get together. Yes, this is fabulous. Thanks for having me on as a guest. Dylan. Yeah, no problem. I, I mean, obviously you're uh, an important guest for me to have on the show. Anybody that follows my work knows that I, I support your charity and make donations and for me, supporting a charity like yours was sort of the last piece of the puzzle for me to morally be okay with keeping exotic animals because there's a, you know, I sort of accumulated these when I was a little bit younger and then ended up thinking about it a little more deeply and wondering if that was the right thing to do. If I, sh if I do love animals so, so much, should I be keeping them as pets, especially ones that are from the wild? And um, I came to the conclusion with sort of a tightly knit moral thought process that as long as I am keeping captive bred animals and simultaneously able to support a charity like yours, then uh, I think that I could be a benefit to to the to the hobby as well as the animals that are in the wild. So I really appreciate you coming on, and maybe we'll start with how this whole thing got started. So if you wrote a letter to your twelve year old self, would she be surprised, or would it make sense for her that you were the founder of uh, Amazon Rainforest Conservancy? Oh no, not at all. I I'm probably the most surprised person of everyone that <laughs> this is what I'm doing. I mean, even if you had told me ten years ago. I'd be heading up a Canadian charity that does con conservation in the Amazon. I would have laughed in your face. You might as well have told me I was going to the moon. It's just so bizarre how life has its twists and turns like that. So I guess for me, it all started back in 2011. And a friend of mine was celebrating a milestone birthday. And she wants to do the trek to Machu Picchu in Peru. And she invited me to come along because her husband had already done the trek. And at the time, I had not even heard of Machu Picchu, but I didn't care. I'd been a stay-at-home mom for over a decade, and I needed an adventure. So I looked at the map to see where Machu Picchu was located, and I saw it was next door to the Amazon rainforest. So I phoned my friend, and I said, we will never be down in South America again. We have to add on a quick side trip to the Amazon rainforest. We're going to be right there. And she agreed, and so we did. And it was just a, a quick three-day visit, but it was transforming for me. Um, I'll never forget the first time of being in the Amazon. I, I felt like I was on a Hollywood movie set. It just seemed so unreal, because there was so much going on. Uh, there were macaws screeching, monkeys howling, insects buzzing. There were these multicolored butterflies fluttering around me, leaf cutter ants marching below me. There were huge towering trees being strangled by thick vines that looked like big snakes. And during those three days, our guide took us on tracks exploring the rainforest and it was wonderful. But I was not aware of the real impact the rainforest had on me until I returned home to Canada. And I was driving home from the airport and tears were streaming down my face, and I felt so sad. And it was the same sadness that I had experienced the first year I went to overnight camp when I was 10. I was homesick. I was homesick for the jungle, and I knew I had to go back. So I went back two months later, but this time in doing, instead of doing the touristy thing, I was taken to see what was really occurring, and I saw firsthand ancient trees being cut down, I saw the illegal gold mining camps that had sprung up everywhere. I saw the highways being built that were slicing through the territories of uncontacted tribes. And the reality was startling, and I felt an overwhelming responsibility to do something. So when I came home from the second trip, I searched for a Canadian organization doing conservation work in the area of the Amazon that I had visited because I wanted to volunteer for them. And I couldn't find one. There was an American group. There was a group from the United Kingdom, but nothing Canadian. So I decided I had to start my own. And that was the beginning, beginning of Amazon Rainforest Conservancy, or ARC for short. Wow. So, so in a nutshell, you, I don't know if you, were you not interested in really nature at all up until that point, slash also had no experience starting a charity? This was just something that you just felt this deep purpose to pursue? Yeah, I mean, I've always loved being outdoors and hiking, and and but my, my background is I was a human resources advisor in, in you know a corporate corporation for many years prior to staying home. Um, so I didn't have the background as a scientist or a conservationist. No, I was just going by the seat of my pants. 
That's amazing. That's uh, it's a. I mean, I know the experience you're talking about the first time you step into a rainforest. I've not been to the Amazon, but I've been to uh, Central American rainforests, and it is. I understand your analogy of being on a movie set because it's just, it's almost, it, it is very almost too perfect to describe. It's it's this very strange, almost mystical experience. Exactly, exactly, and totally life changing for me. Mm-hmm. So how do you, how did you, so at that point you're, you think, okay, I need to start a charity. What are the, what are the steps at that point? I don't even know how you would begin. Right. So first I established uh, ARC as a nonprofit organization and that's simple and easy to do. But I realized that I had to become a registered charity because everyone in Canada, when they donate, they want a tax receipt, which totally makes sense. So I had to apply for charitable status from the Canadian government. And back then it was the Harper government and they were not friendly to issuing charitable status, especially to an organization wanting to do work outside of Canada. And so it was a long process. They would ask me for information. I would provide it to them. Uh, Then they would ask me for more reports. I would provide it to them. It just went on and on. And I think they were just trying to wear me out. So after probably a good 18 months of this, um, a friend of mine said, you know what, you should go down there and film what's going on and show them. So uh, I went down, I rented a camera and myself and two of my Peruvian friends spent two weeks filming. And then I brought all the footage back to Canada and a friend of mine helped me edit it all into a 30 minute documentary, which I sent to the government. And two months later, I got the letter, charity status is granted. Wow. (laughs) I'll never forget that. It was two long years and I was so excited, but I was all really scared because that meant now I really had to do something. Yeah. The pressure's there now. Yeah. And you know, it's so interesting back then in all my reports that I sent to them, I could not mention the term climate change because it was considered too controversial. So we have come a long way since then. Yeah. And that's not even that long ago as well, but, but you're right. It has come a long way. So do, do you know, like what compelled you? Like obviously the experience being there, but like, do, do you have any understanding of where that came from to the, the, the sort of need to feel like you needed to help? Or is that just something, a wave that you're kind of riding? Um, I think seeing the destruction and how massive it was blew me away. And, you know, you always hear, oh, the Amazon rainforest is the lungs of the planet. We get, you know, 20% of our oxygen there. And and I think, too, you know, having children and worrying about their future and the future of, you know, potential grandchildren, I started to think, you know, I've got to get involved somehow. And I kind of was thinking that for previous few years, but hadn't figured out how to do that or what really was my passion and where my skills were. So... I guess you could say I was I was open and ready and it just the timing was right and and it just being in the jungle it just spoke to me. Mhm. Yeah, and I, I've never seen destruction firsthand, but I'm guessing it's something that pictures and video are are even hard to convey how how what it feels like when you're there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mhm. So so now that you have the fr- you had the framework set up for the charity, and then I guess the next steps are are literally just going and, and trying to buy. Is it you just buy land and then protect it, or or was was there another area that you started first? Yeah, the first thing I decided to do is I, I wanted to look for land to buy to protect protect, and I knew I wanted to be the land to be in the area of Tampopata, Peru, because Tampopata is a really special region, which I can talk about later. But that was the area that I had traveled to as well, so I was familiar with it. And I knew that I wanted to buy land that had primary ancient rainforest trees because in a lot of the areas, the trees had all been cut down in the last 100 years and most of the forest was secondary trees. And I guess for for romantic reasons, for sentimental reasons, it was really important to me that the land that I bought to protect had these first growth trees. So that meant I had to look for land in, in a very remote area, far from any town and any roads. So I went on several trips and I traveled with a forest engineer and we checked out several spots and, uh, but nothing excited him. I mean, every piece of land we looked at, I was like, Oh, this is great. And he kept saying, no, no, not special enough, not special enough. So I went back to Canada and he continued to look. Um, 
And then one day I got a message from him. I found it. I found the spot. It's unbelievable. So he found a piece of land for sale that had the huge ancient trees that I wanted. And he was really emotional because he found trees that he'd barely seen because they'd been logged to, to extinction in, in most areas. And he sent me a photo of him standing next to this huge tree. And it was a cedar species that he'd never seen before. And it had a great big number 11 spray painted on it because the owner of the land was pl planning on cutting down this tree because the wood's so valuable. And he said to me, if we don't do something, these tree species will only live in photographs. So he was also excited because there was a mammal clay lick on the land. And this is where animals come to eat clay for the salt content, salt being an important mineral for their health. And at the clay lick, he, they found uh, footprints of many mammals, including tapirs and anteaters and jaguars. And they found the den of a giant armadillo they also found uh, anaconda tracks from a large anaconda that was traveling between ponds on the land. So it just, it, it had so much, I guess, of the, the tree species, the plant species, evidence of animals there. And so that was our first purchase in 2014. And then in 2016, a neighboring property came available and we bought that too. So he, he really knew what he was looking for and was going to hold out till he find, found that you know, perfect piece. Yeah, which is good because as I say, everything I saw, I was like, this looks good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so who's selling the land? Is it, the, is it government owned or is there actually private owners that are putting the land up for sale? Yeah, well, it's... At first, I was looking at buying private land, but then... I looked into what the other conservation groups down there were doing, and most of them are utilizing uh, a concession model in Peru. And basically what that means is rather than purchase land privately, uh, you enter into a long-term partnership with the Peruvian government who owns the land. And which, so the reason we decided to do this is if we, purchase land privately, we could say for, for X, amount of ma X amount of money by a small parcel. But if we went into a, a concession model, we could purchase a lot, a much greater area of land to protect. And the concession model is, is good because the government is happy because they can't conserve all this land that's in remote and unpopulated areas. So it would be unprotected. So we purchase it from an individual who owns the contract with the Peruvian government. Gotcha. Interesting. So how big are these chunks of land? Like, for example, the first one that you bought, what, what, what kind of size are we talking? Well, the two of them together are um, 1,416 hectares, which is 3,500 acres. Now, it's really hard to picture what that looks like. So if you imagine in your mind the size of one football field, and then you think of 2,650 football fields laid side by side, that is the amount of the land in our care currently. So it's a big chunk. Yeah, that is so cool. And so, so then how does that work? I mean, obviously you own the land, but, but protecting itself must be, must be difficult because I, I know that you guys are in the works of get, having people kind of stay there permanently. And we can talk about that in a bit, but before that, um, it, what do you do to prevent people from, from walking onto the land? Obviously, that's a huge chunk. You can't have people walking it every day. Yeah, and that's, that's what we're hoping going forward. We're hoping that we can hire wardens who will patrol the land to keep it safe from invaders and that they'll also you know, live on the land and perhaps um, do some, some recording of, of inventory of, of flora and fauna for us and, and other things. But yeah, it would be good to have a constant presence on the land. Yeah, that's definitely, I'm sure, one of the main challenges. And in terms of what is like damaging the land, obviously it's humans, <laughs> but the there's just a few main industries that are that are going after the rainforest. Yeah, well, my expertise obviously is is Tampapada, where where we're doing our work. And you know, just 50 years ago, it was a remote, sparsely inhabited corner of the Amazon because it was uncon unconnected by road to the rest of the world. But then two things happened, and one was the opening of the Interoceanic Highway in 2011, 
and this is a huge highway, I think it's almost 3,000 kilometers long. It was financed by Brazil and it connects the Atlantic Ocean port in Brazil to the Pacific Ocean port in Peru, which allows the easier transport of goods from Brazil to China and India. But the issue is it slices right through the rainforest and has opened up previously remote and untouched areas of the Amazon, such as the area of Tambopata. And it sprouted a whole network of secondary roads. So these new roads are being used by people from Brazil and the highlands of Peru, and they're all flocking to the area to exploit the natural resources. And the so, other, sorry, go oh, ahead. Sorry. Was, like, do these countries have, I, I know you're saying, obviously it's a, a giant chunk of land, so the government, it, it is tough for them to protect it, but do they have conservation measures in place or is it just, you know, they, they prefer to have that highway go through so they're less concerned about conserving conserving that those parts of the rainforest yeah unfortunately right now the 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 mostly the feeling is how do we make money from the rainforest not about conserving it right yeah that, i guess that um you know it's i think it's difficult for people in maybe north america to understand how it, it, a business is done very different in in south america and in central american countries it, not everywhere but in a lot of places and and certain that the, the, there's less rules and there's a lot more law breaking than we would be used to here i'm sure oh absolutely it's still it's like the wild west down there yeah anything goes and i know that uh one of the is i think in in the area that you guys protect is it's gold mining which is one of the one of the issues is that right yeah g gold in the form of gold dust can be found all over tambopata and artisanal gold mining has been a traditional livelihood there for, for many years. And it's um, been something that a lot of impoverished farmers would do to supplement their income. But uh, the price of gold just skyrocketed in 2008. I think the price rose up by like 300%. Yeah. So, and this has fueled a massive increase in illegal gold mining here. Um, and the government estimates there are probably about 40,000 illegal gold miners in the area. Wow. And they're, they're clearing the forest and they're, they're basically, they're changing the landscape from a jungle to a desert. There are so many illegal gold mining sites in the region. They can actually be seen from space. It's just unbelievable. And, and that was really hit home to me when I was on the, the airplane and you're flying you know, into Tambopata or into sort of the, the capital city, Porto Maldonado. And you're you're going over just green, green, green of the of the Amazon, and then you hit these huge patches, and it, it does it looks just like a desert where the gold miners have uh, done their work. So when they mine, they basically just devastate everything. They have to pull the trees out and dig giant holes. I'm sure. Exactly, exactly, and you know the impact extends beyond just their forest clearing because they use mercury to extract the gold. And that mercury is, is poisoning the rivers and the people and the living species there. Um, now, mercury in gold mine is illegal in many countries because it is so dangerous to both human health and the environment, but it's still used in Peru. It's the easiest, fastest, and cheapest method to extract the gold. Um, and actually, we, we filmed, a, we were able to film a, a gold miner, a small illegal mining camp, and in our documentary, you film the gold miner and he's using his bare leg to stir the mercury into his barrel, uh, barrel of gold dust particles. And oh so these guys have direct um, impact or with contact. With contact. Thank you. Yes. Um, wow. It's just this. It's just it's alarming. So scientists went down there to measure mercury levels. And they found that 78% of adults in this region have mercury levels above the acceptable level. And essentially, these people are they're, they're slowly dying from mercury poisoning. And it's, mercury causes severe damage to the brain, the central nervous system, major organs, um, and it's especially toxic to children. Um, it's just, it's really, really scary. And it's estimated that 30 to 40 tons of mercury are dumped into the rivers here. And the mercury accumulates in the tissue of fish, and fish is the main food source in the area. Wow. So, I mean, my guess is these, I mean, these miners, I'm sure, are not evil people that are going out to destroy the rainforest. Is a, is a lot of the miner activity just people that are trying to survive and they just need money? 
Well, or is it, some or is of the both? miners are just people trying to feed their families. And that's the way it, it was traditionally. But now the illegal miners are, the majority are a large, organized, and dangerous group. Because, um, you know, essentially gold has become Peru's new cocaine. Um, Peru was the single largest producer and exporter of cocaine in the world. Uh, then the U.S. war on drugs put these cocaine producers under increasing pressure. And then with the, the price of gold rising, a lot of these criminal groups shifted from cocaine to the illegal gold mining. So it's the organized crime that's running these, hu these huge illegal mining camps. And the miners are armed. They have no respect for authority. And they literally believe in the law of the jungle. The strongest wins. They have no problem gunning down someone who stands in their way. And the mining camps are really dangerous places. They're lawless zones. I mean, guns and drugs everywhere. There's murders every day. And there's human trafficking, child labor, child prostitution. Um, parents in impoverished villages are told their daughters will work in a restaurant in the mining camp and they'll send money home. And instead, the, the girls are brought to the camp and forced to work in brothels. So, yeah, it's scary stuff. Yeah, that is that is very scary. And so, so are the locals there? Uh, obviously, they are not happy with the mines, or or is it more so like there's nothing they can do about it? Like, do they support uh, efforts like your effort with with Arc to to try to stop this? Or it's interesting. So most people there, there's so few legitimate jobs that people, a lot of people, realize what they're doing isn't good for the environment, but they feel they have no alternative, which they don't. Uh, not only are there so few legit legitimate jobs, but the ones that there are, they, they don't really pay a proper wage. So, you know, in a, a week of mining, you could make what a policeman would or a teacher would make in a, in a month. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of, there's not, so a lot of, like the miner that we we chatted with, and he was doing it because he was just trying to feed his family, and he said, look, I will continue to do this until there's an alternative way for me to make money. So that's one group. Then there's your second group who they just care about the money. So, you know, the environment means nothing to them. And um, those are the, the and, and a lot of them are in high levels of government. Um, so, that was going to be my next question. If, uh, if the local government is to, cooperates with you or are they more of a hindrance? So I'm guessing it's a mixture of both then. Yeah, a mixture of both. The, the mayor of the area where we're working, he is an actual gold miner. So, <laughs> um, But then there's other levels of, of government or not so much government, but associations, I guess, separate from the government that are trying to make some changes. Um, so, it, yeah, it's just interesting. It, it's, it's just tricky because there's so much bribes and intimidation and corruption stand in the way of reform. So I think just through this past August, a journalist did a whole expose and they found that many Peruvian high government officials had links to the illegal mining. So they might be saying, you know, what they're saying and what they're doing are two different things. Right. Yeah. And I, th I think, as I said, it's so, it's so bizarre, it's so foreign for people in North America to understand or have seeing a society operate like that, where you have, I mean, of course we have crooked politicians here, but it's nothing like it is down there. And it's, yeah, like you said, it's the wild west. It's, and it's a difficult problem to solve. Very difficult, very difficult because even, even the, 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 the government officials or the police that are trying to stop the illegal mining, they're, they're bribed with, with, by the, by the mining mafia. And if they don't accept the bribe, then they're threatened with death. So it's you know, a rock and a hard place. Exactly. Exactly. Is, is there a place where people can see that documentary that you had filmed originally? Yes. Yes. It's on our website. Oh, okay. Awesome. Yeah. And I'll, I'll put all the links in the show notes. Everybody will see that. Um, they can look at, at, at afterwards. So in terms of the, you obviously have a large group of people that are helping with the charity, but there's a bunch of different roles because I think you have some researchers as well as a few other characters. So what are some of the roles that you have uh, underneath the, uh, the umbrella of the charity? Well, we're really small and we are actually all volunteers up here in Canada. And we've got one salaried employee in Peru and the rest of the people in Peru are volunteers as well. 
So we have, you know, some of our, so some of the people in our team and our board of directors, they're biologists. Um, and two of them are actually herpetologists, which would interest you. Mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah. So they actually can do research. So when they, they can go down and they have land, they can do research on. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So that's very interesting. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely an issue, uh, a problem to solve, but the work that you guys are doing is incredible. But now that I th I'm thinking about it, like I know you had sent out that letter uh, maybe a month ago to, to some of the supporters and you guys had found some mining equipment even on the land that you guys own. So how worried are you about the danger aspect of them sort of encroaching on your space? It's been really challenging the past couple of years because everybody in, our, in the area we were looked at us with suspicion. Now, the area we are, there's no big mining camps, which is one of the reasons we chose that area, so it's safer. But everybody there, they're all Brazil nut harvesters, and they're all supplementing their income with, with illegal gold mining on their land. And so when we came in, they were very suspicious of us because they figured we were going to get in their way. And uh, they made some threats. Um, they came onto our land when we were harvesting our Brazil nuts shooting their guns and basically scared us off and then stole all our Brazil nuts. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's been <laughs> pretty challenging, but we've worked really hard to kind of say to them, listen, we're just doing our own little thing here. You, we don't want to bother you. You do your thing. We can both exist peacefully. And for the first time, I just got a, a email from, our executive director down there and he was coming back from the land by boat and he said wow i even got a few waves <laughs> wow There's some progress there because <laughs> yes. that is the thing is you definitely as i mean obviously you might not agree with what they're doing but you want to make sure that you at least uh don't seem like an enemy to them exactly at first our first thought was we were going to go in and we were going to you know tell the ministry of environment this is this is what they're doing and come here and blow up all their machinery and but uh, then we realize that's just gonna make it very dangerous for us so right and i so in terms of the uh, living quarters that you guys are, are deciding to make down there can you talk a little bit about that plan and and sort of what that would look like i'm guessing you have maybe rotating volunteers or maybe people that live down there will, will stay on the land itself that's what we'd like right now our accommodation is pretty primitive i mean it's basically a tent <laughs> And some of these guys don't even use a tent. They just put, you know, a tarp up. Um, so, and we've got so many people that want to come down, especially researchers. I mean, there's, there's so much to, to, to investigate down there. I mean, there's species that haven't even been discovered. Um, and the, the mining pits are really interesting um, as well. Um, it's so it's funny because, the, one of the pieces of land that we bought, the previous owner had been doing some mining on it. Um, fortunately, very small scale. Otherwise, we wouldn't have purchased the land. But we inherited his abandoned mining ponds. And we're kind of, you know, wondering, well, we need to figure out what to do to help revitalize that area of the land, etc. So um, back in December 2017, we had some of our biologists down down spending at the land for a bit and and they made a discovery that was totally unexpected um they were looking at these mining ponds and they found that these old mining pits had now turned into kind of a, a new aquatic system something they hadn't seen before in tamapata so they found diverse frog populations they found uncommon huron species a caiman and abundance of fish in these abandoned mining pits. And they also found the presence of rare keystone species such as giant river otters and black caiman. It was just astounding. So we have a really unique opportunity to study the resilience of the forest to small scale illegal gold mining. And it's actually, you know, really, really a positive thing. Like it's amazing how in just a couple of years that uh, this new aquatic system has, has grown. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, it's just a testament to the diversity of life that's in in those areas because like how do fish get into like I'm guessing it's not necessarily connected to waterways or anything, but it is they just sort of pop up and there is a lot of life in the rainforest and it's really amazing. Oh yeah. Yeah, so going back to 
to building an accommodation. So that's what we're just in the process of doing right now. We've uh, completed a platform and roof, and we're just going to put the sides up. And so we're, at least we're going to have a small place where, where people can come and, and be able to, to sleep and cook. Is it, does it get fairly uh, rainy? Like, do you, I'm guessing uh, you have to deal with the rainy season of some sort. Yeah, the rainy, the rainy season is crazy. And it's really interesting, actually, because it's changed. It used to start, uh, I think, no, November, December, and then end. It, I mean, it used to be they could say the rainy season starts here and ends here. And now it's it's starting much earlier, ending later. They're getting huge amounts of rain more than they used to. I mean, the whole town in Porto about Porto Maldonado floods every year. It's just crazy. So yeah, the rainy season is a more difficult time to do research, but some people love it because there is, especially the, the herpetologists love it because of all the frogs. Yeah. Everything comes out in the rain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we'd like to eventually build a proper research center so then we could have, you know, scientists and students from around the world come to the land and work on projects. Yeah, that would be that would be amazing. So I guess that that's where a lot of the any donations that you receive now is really going to that, that home base type setup in, on the property or on the land. Yes, yes. And also, I would like once we ha- now that we have our proper accommodation, we should have that completed in a couple of months. I would really like to hire some some conservation wardens to stay at the land. And safe. just protect it. Yeah. yeah. No, that's cool. And so, so how often do you get yourself to go to go down to the to visit the land? So I go a couple times a year. Um, I, the last time I was there was April this year. And actually that <laughs> another problem down in Peru, of course, is I shouldn't say of course, but is theft. And we were all set to go to the land, a team of us, and two days before we were to leave, we found out that the motor on our boat that was stored at the port had been stolen. So, you know, no motor means <laughs> no, <laughs> not going to the land. So that was right. really frustrating. So um, you, had to, you weren't able to get to the land at all? You kind of have to just stay in the town? Yeah, because the land is... You, we have, you have to take two, two boats to get there. One is a bigger boat, and then you have to leave the big boat at a port and take a smaller smaller boat along the river. So we were trying to see if we could rent a big boat, and we just there was none available. So, yeah, so I didn't even get to the land in April, and that was really frustrating. Oh, I bet it was, yeah. And so once you're on the land and, and you're there – can you describe the feeling? Like, are, are you are you comfortable? Are you just at peace? Or is it uh, like, because I guess you're really roughing it, really. It's up, right? You don't have a structure to, besides maybe a, a small structure right now to live in. But do you care about any of that when you're there? Or is it just kind of freedom? You know, it's funny. Because I've done a lot of um, camping in Canada. And I feel safer in the jungle than I do in the, the woods in, say, northern Ontario. And I, it, it, I don't know why that is. And it's actually not, not reality. <laughs> it's I'm way yeah. safer in the, in the woods in, in Ontario than I am in, in the jungle. I think I have a false sense of security. I'm starting to learn now. I got to be more careful because um, it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. Uh, even just we were trekking along and we came back to sort of our main camp and we, you have to wear rubber boots when you're trekking through the jungle because of the snakes. And I took my rubber boots off and I put on my flip flops and I was just walking, just walking around. And one of the guys stopped me. He said, you can't walk around in your flip flops. There's, there's little mites that'll get in your toes and, and you can get a serious disease. And he said, here, quick, quick. And he gave me some alcohol rubs. He said, wipe your feet. You've got to, you can lose your toes. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> it seems fine. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Is there is there a lot of insects and things that you I mean everyone um, in Canada we're used to just mosquitoes, but I know that in the rainforest obviously the insects are much larger, but are those an issue for you guys at all besides maybe mites that eat your toes off? <laughs> <laughs> um I guess I mean there if you're careful and you know I 
you, you don't, you, there, I think you don't really have to worry. I think it's one of those things that you have no control over. Let's put it that way. So we have somebody in our team who recently stepped on a stingray. It's just one of those things that just happens and you, you can't predict it. You can't prepare for it. Um, because there's so much out there in the jungle. Yeah, that's true. I mean, there there is, and I'm guessing to, to get back to the town where you have some medical professionals is probably a, a very long trip. How long does it take to, to do the, the full boat boat ride to get to the land? So the full trip there and back is about eight and a half hours. So it's quite a trick. It's quite a, quite a trick, yeah. And uh, yeah, I remember when I was in Costa Rica, I had stayed in this place that was like a, a couple hour boat ride and it was literally just in the middle of the jungle. And, and the, the thought does cross your mind once in a while, like, wow, if anything happened to me, I, it would be very difficult to survive this situation because it's, it's quite a while to, to get back. But I guess, like you say, you just kind of have uh, prepared. I'm sure you guys have first aid and whatnot there. Um, but you do have that false sense of security. It's, it's strange. Absolutely, absolutely. And the thing that is also scary, I mean, I guess poisonous snakes are probably the main concern. And I, my understanding is the anti-venom is, is a very low supply around the world. It's very hard to, to get. It's very expensive too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. Have you had any issues with wildlife on, on the property in terms of, you know, getting into garbage or whatnot? Or is it uh, mostly okay? No, yeah, we haven't had any issues because I think because we're so remote that any wildlife would look at us and, and be terrified. Right. Yeah, they're not used to humans at all, I guess. So what what kind of wildlife have you have you seen on on the property? I'm sure you've seen some pretty incredible animals. Yeah, we have. And it's, you know, a lot of what we've seen is is through tracks or scat or dens. Um, but one of the things that I was really excited about was the, that there, we know there's jaguars on our land cause we've seen their tracks and the jaguar It's frustrating because the ranchers and the farmers in the Amazon view the jaguars as a threat to their livestock and they don't hesitate to kill them. So they're becoming an endangered species, which is just heartbreaking. Um, so it was nice to see the jaguar tracks. Yeah, that's awesome. And jaguar is a fairly... I mean, for some of the, like the, the, um, indigenous people is a, is a pretty symbolic animal, is it not? Oh, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's kind of a revered and obviously they don't want it to, to disappear. Yeah. You know what, what was even more thrilling, but also frightening as well is there are uncontacted people in Tambopata. Uh, yeah. Which is really, really cool. Um, because many scientists think that this region has the last and final block of intact tropical rainforest and rainforest land in the world. And so they know, we know that there's small isolated indigenous communities who have chosen to remain completely cut off from the outside world. And they estimate there's probably between a few hundred and a few thousand people who live in voluntary isolation in Tambopata. And one of the, the tribes, it's called the Janae tribe, and I might be saying it wrong, but um, we know very little, bit, very little about them. But if, if you go on our website, you can see the first photos that were taken of this tribe. Uh, it was back in 2011. And um, we know they're nomadic hunter-gatherers, and they move through the rainforest according to the seasons in small extended family groups. Um, and normally, they've only been seen sporadically, and mostly their presence was, was known only from the signs and sounds they make, warning people to vacate an area. Um, but in the last few years, something has shifted, and they, they're emerging, emerging from seclusion, and they can now be seen on riverbanks, hailing boats and asking for food and clothing. They're, they're raiding villages. Uh, it's just very, very bizarre that their behavior is changing from avoidance to aggression. And anthropologists are trying to figure out why. Uh, one theory is that the intrusion of all these mining companies and natural gas companies and the logging industries, the road construction, uh, drug traffickers is displacing them from their territories. Um, so we 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 heard about them, but um, in 2017 there were frequent sightings 
and vocal detections of this tribe right near our land. So a 30 kilometer straight line from our land is a spot on the river where there's a trading market for the local rainforest communities. And the Yine was there. They went into that trading market and, and, and stole a bunch of, bunch of things. Wow. So we were like, whoa. Yeah, I guess if you're going to talk about the most dangerous animal, like it's, it's going to be them because it's, do they, they don't, I guess they don't speak Spanish. It's hard to communicate with these, uh, with these people when they do encounter them. Yeah. Yeah. They don't speak Spanish. You're absolutely right. But there are some, um, other tribes in Tambupada who speak a language. I guess they, they're, they are the descendants of the Janae. So they they speak a, a language that's fit kind of similar, so they've been able to do a little bit of communication with them. Wow, that is it is. You're right. The word is bizarre to think about because it's very hard to wrap your mind around um, a tribe that's been uncontacted and, and the the fact that they've had thousands of years of growing up in the same environment. Like the they know the rainforest better than anybody. Exactly. And actually, there, there was one uh, village where they went into the village and they actually shot two of the villagers with arrows to the heart. So, yeah, they're just, I mean, they're, they're, they're in defensive mode right now, which not surprising because their territories are being invaded. Right. Yeah. And they would have really no understanding of why they're being, the, the, the forest is being bulldozed over, right? They're, they're not... They, I'm sure they don't have gold as a part of their trading system if they're mostly hunter gatherers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So then we had a four person team on our land um, and they were doing inventory of the flora and fauna. And uh, they uh, had a situation happen that really freaked them out. <laughs> so each day they would separate into two teams. So two of them would cover different areas of, of the land. And uh, one day the teams got back to the base camp and one team realized they had lost their Sharpie pen. So they must have left it in the rainforest. And so the next day they went back to work and they were retracing their steps to, I guess, begin where they had ended. And in front of them, (laughs) they found their Sharpie pen was hanging from a long vine from a tree. Oh my God, <laughs> that's bone chilling. <laughs> I mean, we were in an area totally unpopulated, very inaccessible. Um, and that kind of behavior, apparently, of hanging objects from this certain kind of vine is something that the Janae tribe would do. So it's pretty likely that they were being watched <laughs> by some non aggressive members of the tribe, probably a, a small group of females who then, you know, found the Sharpie and said, you know, just to let you know, we're here too. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's a whole other level of respect of the space, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. So then we thought, you know what? We might have to halt everything. We don't want to be in their way. So, uh, but th- the last year, there's been no evidence of them. So it sounds, it looks like they retreated back more into the jungle. It's such an interesting dynamic that I think people for sure don't think about when they're talking about protecting the rainforest is there are those uncontacted tribes that are part of that whole ecosystem. And, and we do want to protect them because we, we don't want them to disappear. And it's I always think about if if something happened where the Internet shut down and we lost the electricity, there would be only one group of people that would survive on the planet. And it would be it would be that group because <laughs> nothing would be different for them. And we would all not know how to function. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's very cool. But definitely I can imagine the fear that would be because if there's an animal, you know that they might not be afraid of you, right? And, and they can do things in the rainforest that you would never be able to, like they know every plant, every what what's poisonous, what's not. So that's very cool. So one of the things that uh, I want to chat with you about is, is how do we get people excited or, or engaged in protecting the rainforest. I mean, it's it's one of those things where people tend to support charities that they have a deep understanding of why they're so important. And typically that comes from some kind of experience, like you had the experience in the rainforest that sort of opened your eyes. Is is there anything that we can do to, to promote that to people that don't? Because not everybody's going to get that experience to go to the rainforest, but how do we get people excited to donate or to support it without having that, you know, you know trip down, down there? 
Yeah. Yeah. It's very difficult because a lot of people, and a lot of people say to me, well, why should we even care up here in North, North America about the health size? Of the- We've got our own environmental issues. So here's what I tell people. And one of the main things is scientists have determined the Amazon rainforest plays a key role in the basic functioning of this planet. So there's a clear link between the health of the Amazon and climate patterns. And we know climate change is already affecting Canada. We are experiencing extreme forest fires. I mean, forest fires have always been an essential part of our ecosystem, but the last few summers we've experienced some of the worst fires on record. And one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that our wildlife that lives in the boreal forest is in trouble. For instance, the gray jay, I mean, I love the gray jay. It's a plucky little bird and it stays in Canada all winter long. And it uses trees like a refrigerator. So it stashes morsel of its food in the trees to last all winter into the early spring. But now with the warmer winters, their, their food that they've stored is starting to spoil. And by spring, there's nothing left to feed their chicks. So they're in trouble. And then I guess the other thing that, that's clear is that as conditions warm up in Canada, species from further south are coming north. For instance, the deer tick, which carries Lyme disease, and studies show that the deer ticks range is expanding by 45 kilometers every year. And you know, cases of Lyme disease have been reported across, across Canada in areas where it was never thought to exist. So, oh yeah, in in Manitoba we have like some of the highest Lyme disease instances in the world, I think, per capita. Okay, really? Okay, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, preventing deforestation of the Amazon helps mitigate climate change, and that affects the health and well-being of families and economies throughout the world. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's not a it's not just protecting that one area. It it has sort of a domino effect as we destroy that part of the world. Yeah, it, it's not just about saving trees and wildlife. It's about saving ourselves. Because there are some scary statistics. Like they're saying rainforests are being destroyed at a rate of over 80,000 acres per day and they once covered 14% of the earth's land surface and now they only cover 6%. And here's the scariest one. Experts estimate humans could destroy the last remaining rainforest in 40 years. That's just unbelievable. Yeah, that is unbelievable. And I mean, as you already said, there's, I mean, 80,000 acres is so difficult to visualize, but it's just an unbelievable amount of land. But as as you said earlier, there's that old growth forest that's just shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And and some of those species inside those areas are going to be gone if we don't protect them and we can't just reestablish a tree that's been there for uh, do do you know the age of some of the oldest trees on on the land i'm sure it's pretty incredible yeah well we have brazil nut trees we probably about over 400 brazil nut trees and they live for 500 years or more in fact some scientists think they can reach the age of 1000 years so we've got trees that are at least 500 years maybe a thousand years old which is so cool i mean they store huge amounts of carbon yeah, that and and if you've not seen a giant tree in the rainforest before, it's incredible. It's impossible to describe, but when you see it, it's just it really is just breathtaking. Yeah, we have a really cool video on our website as well, and we have a drone that that follows a Brazil nut tree because and it just shows you how huge it is. It's just it is. It's the giant of the rainforest because they reach heights of up to two hundred feet or six sixty one meters. I still think in feet. <laughs> I know. For some reason, heights are always feet in, in Canada still. We haven't fully switched. <laughs> I know. I know. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, it is really, that's so, so true. And, and, you know, I know when I was in university, I took this class. It was called um, like forest botany, I think. And I remember the last day, I'll never forget this. My, my professor was very obsessed with trees, which was awesome. And, and the last day she was talking to us about deforestation and, and, you know, caring about trees. And she actually broke down and started crying. Like that's, that's how much she cared about it. And it, it was one of those things that really stuck with me because I, I really enjoyed the course, but at the time I hadn't thought about it deep enough to be like emotionally attached to it like she was. And it was, it was just one of those things that will always stay with me that, you know, you see someone reacting like that and you think, wow, that, that must have, she must have had an experience that, that made her feel that way. And it, it must be important. And, and, you know, human nature is not a lot of, we're a lot more common than, 
than not. And to, to see someone reacting like that, you think, I bet if I had her experience, I probably would have reacted the same way, which means I should probably care about it. Right, right. And you know, another thing that I did not even realize until I started getting involved with this work down there is that 25% of our modern medicines come from tropical rainforest plants. Yes, that's true. Yeah, there's tons of research and we haven't even even begun to describe all the plants and things. And, and there's so many different medications that come from alkaloids and whatnot that, that are discovered in plants. So that's a really good point as well. Yeah, like the leaves, the bark, the sap, they're used to make the medicines we use for cancer, diabetes, arthritis, Alzheimer's, like I had no idea. And then the other really cool thing, which you just kind of touched on is we only know how to use 1% of these plants to make medicines to fight human diseases. And so in the Amazon, there are 40,000 different kinds of plant species. And we only know the medicinal properties of 400 of these plants. You imagine 400 out of 40,000. So Just the imagine cure, what's in there. Yeah, the cure to many diseases is held in the Amazon rainforest. Yeah, it really is the, the, almost the heart of, of the, the planet in that sense. Is it, It's just that perfect Goldilocks zone where everything can grow and everything can thrive. And, and it would be impossible to replicate if we turned it into a desert. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And that's the other experience that I had when I first stepped into a rainforest. Is it, And I'm sure it's similar to what you were experiencing. Is It's almost like... It's, it's like this perfect place. And when you walk through it, you're just the whole time, it, it feels like homey almost. And I guess that might be part of the reason why you feel so comfortable sleeping there is like, it's just something so natural about it. And I think because that's, you know, we're not made to be living in concrete buildings, or I shouldn't say we're not made to, but we didn't evolve living in, in cities. And when you submerse yourself in this unbelievable forest, it's the most peaceful experience you can probably have. Yeah. And it's humbling because you realize how really small and ins insignificant we are. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Well, that is uh, really interesting. And uh, I think you did a really great job of sort of mapping out uh, the project you guys are working on. And, and I'm, I'm really excited to, to be able to support the charity. And, and I really hope that you can get that permit structure up and we can start protecting that land. C can you let everybody know where they can find you, social media and whatnot? Yeah, so we have our website, AmazonRainforestConservancy.com. Um, we're also on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram. Um, yeah, but probably our website is the best place to find us. That's where all the information is. And you can find links to our social media on the website as well. Awesome. And, and just as a reminder, basically everybody is a volunteer besides the one employee you have in in, in Peru. So, so really you guys are doing this. There's, no, there's nothing in it for you besides protecting the rainforest. <laughs> Yeah. And all our work depends entirely on donations from our supporters. So, uh, and we keep our overhead really low. So I cover most of the operating costs. I pay for all my trips to Peru because I want to ensure that people's hard earned money goes right to our projects, not salaries or, you know, marketing materials, that kind of stuff. Um, and Peru is a developing nation. They don't have the financial means to curb destruction to the rainforest. So, and yeah, we can't rely on world governments to preserve the world's forests and the ecological services they provide. It's really up to organizations like ARC to educate, inspire, and raise awareness that we have to make the planet's future a priority. So when people do donate, they, they can be sure that the money is directly going to something that will directly protect the rainforest. Like you said, there's not a ton of salaries. There's not a lot of overhead. It's going to the rainforest. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you coming on today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dylan. You'll have to come down to the land with me one of these days. I absolutely will. Definitely. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to that episode. I really enjoyed recording that episode and listening to the stories that Jana had told us. And I'm so happy that I was able to have that conversation with her because it really puts a better picture in my mind and I hope in your mind as well about what exactly we are contributing to when we do contribute to that charity. Obviously, Jana is an unbelievably determined person to make this project a success, and they've already been an incredible success. I mean, the amount of land that they've been able to protect is unbelievable, and that's just going to continue to grow. And, you know, it took her two years just to get charity status from the government of Canada. And I, I think most people would have given up at that point. I mean, that's a long haul just to get officially registered as a charity. So I'm so happy to be able to support her her charity as well as all the individuals that help out and volunteer for the charity. 
So in the show notes, I'm going to be putting links to everything, the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy website, their social media, any videos or documentaries that they produced, I'll put in the show notes. You can find that at my website at animalsathome.ca slash podcast. And if you would like, definitely go donate to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. I'll leave the link uh, in the show notes how to do that. It's very simple. They accept just one-time donations on on their website, or if you want to do a, a monthly donation, you can do that as well. If you are interested in supporting both Animals at Home and ARC, you can buy an Animals at Home t-shirt or sweater and $5 will be donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. And just by engaging and sharing this podcast and content, uh, you're doing both Amazon Rainforest Conservancy and Animals at Home a huge favor. And if you go to animalsathome.ca slash save dash the dash rainforest, again, that will be in the show notes. You can see how much money we've raised through the animal Animals at Home project that has been donated to the charity. All right. Again, I very much appreciate everyone listening and taking the time today. I do hope you enjoyed that episode and I do hope you start thinking about ways that maybe you can help. It doesn't have to be financial. It can just be sharing these these stories and, and sharing the content. And uh, I think we can make a difference. See you next time.